Now celebrating our 24th year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all-amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. This is edition number 1,253 with a release and air date of Saturday, March 4th, 2023. Please take the program to your air following the Q-Tone. On the air from coast to coast and around the world on the internet since 1993, serving the amateur radio community with weekly reliable amateur radio news and special features, we are This Week in Amateur Radio. We are the worldwide premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,253 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The 2023 Hamvention Awards have been announced. We will have a full report. AMSAT Engineering is recruiting volunteer engineers in both the electrical and mechanical domains. A massive solar flare caused a radio blackout across the United States. A former executive from the Federal Emergency Management Administration pushes to save AM radio in electric vehicles. Parks on the Air introduces their very first contest. We will have all you need to know. Hackers disrupt broadcast radio networks across Russia. Nominations are sought for the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. Cobra takes 11-meter transceivers into the all-mode domain by adding FM. Special sensors are launched to the space station to study the ionosphere this month. And... We will tell you how you can tap into your rich uncle to fund your amateur radio dreams. All of that and a lot more are straight ahead in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites spinning around the planet. With all of the bad weather happening across the country lately, our technology reporter, Rich DeMuro, has taken the guesswork out of selecting the best weather applications for your portable digital device as he reviews some of the best weather apps that are available right now. Australia's own Ono Benshop, BK6FLAB, and Foundations of Amateur Radio will answer that nagging question all amateurs have, are all spiky antennas the same? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with yet another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back in time for a look at what life was like for the amateur radio operator in the early and mid-1930s. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be with us, and he will have all the information you need to know on how to successfully work on tower sidearms. We'll also have the latest news from Parks on the Air. And that's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in the suburbs surrounding Albany, New York, where we are just coming out of the latest Nor'easter, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from the ham shack of K2MST in the Museum of Science and Technology in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where it can't decide whether it wants to snow or rain or ice or just form mud. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. Reporting to you from just outside the capital of Albany in Glenmont, New York, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where Old Man Winter is not quite done with us yet, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're on the weather roller coaster of temps. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. 
Leading off our news this week, the 2023 Hamvention Awards Committee, chaired by Michael Coulter, W8CI, has announced the 2023 Hamvention Award winners. The Special Achievement Award recipient is Dr. Jason McDonald, MD, N2TPA. He's an active, well-known amateur extra class operator who earned his license in 2003. Dr. McDonald began as a radio frequency engineer before changing careers to become a trauma surgeon. Dr. McDonald's amateur radio interests range from operations on the air to international disaster response. His true passion is working with youths to promote amateur radio. Dr. McDonald brings amateur radio to the world through youth projects and scouting, particularly through radio scouting. Empowering youth through education is the goal of the clubs he's helped form. W1PTG is a testing group that Dr. McDonald helped create to offer exams in underserved areas and get more people into the hobby. This team of volunteer examiners graciously donates its time and money to ensure each licensee in the program receives mentor support and a radio. He's been instrumental in promoting international friendship and community through amateur radio by forming scouting clubs in Canada, VA7RSI, the Philippines, W1PTG, and DX1MC, and in Florida, KQ4GCK. To date, more than 500 youths in these clubs have been licensed and are on the air. The Amateur Radio Club of the Year is the Delaware Valley Radio Association, or DVRA, an AWRL-affiliated club formed in 1930 and serving the Trenton, New Jersey metropolitan area. The club has tripled in size over the last six years due to the wide range of amateur radio activities and events they offer. An all-purpose club, the DVRA's activities include public service events, operator training and mentoring, scouting events, informational monthly meetings, parks on the air events, and the operation of a world-class club station. The DVRA's center of activity is club station W2ZQ, which operates on a regular schedule. The station was renovated six years ago and currently houses two complete HF stations, a VHF repeater, an APRS digipeter, and a Winlink VHF RMS node. The recent addition of a 1296 MHz Earth Moon Earth capability has been optimized with the assistance of member Joe Taylor, K1JT. Station activities include an open house, hands-on seminars, contesting, and special event activations. Most importantly, the exchange of ideas that occur within the walls of the building is priceless. The DVRA's focus on training and diversification in its projects attracts new hams and engages radio amateurs at all levels. The Technical Achievement Award recipient is Dr. James Breckall, WA3FET, whose work has been instrumental in amateur radio antenna technology for decades. He has teamed up with many experts in the field to develop state-of-the-art advancements with a wide range of applications, including the numerical electromagnetics code. As a professor of electrical engineering at Penn State University from 1989 to 2022, Dr. Breakall developed cutting-edge antenna technology and mentored his students in amateur radio, resulting in 700 new licensees. Now a retired professor emeritus, he serves as a consultant to the Army, Air Force, and Navy on many antenna-related projects. Nittany Scientific, a company initiated with his students, developed some of the first optimization methods applied to numerical electromagnetics code in a package called NECOPT, a design he called Optimized Wideband Antenna Yagi. The goals of the optimization were minimum peak SWR in a band, maximizing the lowest gain in a band, and maximizing the minimum front-to-back ratio in a band. These optimized wideband antenna Yagi designs have been used in numerous contest and DX stations around the world. Because Breakall wanted this technology to be readily available worldwide, he has never pursued patent licensing. He was also the first to use helicopter measurements and geometrical theory of diffraction techniques for antennas in terrain at HF that led to software such as TA and HFTA. In 2010, Dr. Breakall collaborated with Joe Taylor, Angel Vasquez, WP3R, and Pedro Pisa Jr., NP4A, to use the Arecibo 1,000-foot dish for Earth, Moon, Earth. He worked on many antenna designs at Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico and at the Harp facility in Alaska. Dr. Breakall has frequently presented at Hamvention forums to share his expertise on antenna design and enthusiasm for amateur radio. As an avid amateur radio contester, Dr. Breakall has built contest stations in Pennsylvania and Puerto Rico, and he has participated in more than 100 contests. He's also won a fair amount of them. Dr. Breakall has authored numerous peer-reviewed scientific articles and books. The Amateur of the Year for 2023 is Karsten Dauer, DM9EE. He's been active in European amateur radio through the World Radio Sport Team Championship and Youth on the Air for over 30 years. Recently, he has spearheaded a movement that provides amateur radio equipment to war-torn Ukraine by collecting donations and personally delivering the approximately 5,000 kilograms of radios, power banks, solar packs, and first aid kits that have been shipped to Ukraine. 
Countless hours of planning, packing, documentation, and accessing permits have gone into this endeavor. On the return trips from Ukraine, Dower transports war refugees to havens in Germany, including his own hotel. Supporting fellow hams and inspiring youth involvement is Dower's passion. On his website, he states, Ham radio gave me a lot, and I try to give back to our great hobby. The world is very small when you have a radio license. You talk to the world, and eventually you also visit people in other countries. And you always learn more about culture when you know people there. Ham radio is a great way to learn languages, even if it's only a few friendly phrases. You can read more about the 2023 Hamvention Awards at their website or at awrl.org. Now in our 24th year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, you are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. This is W2XBS on the K2RHI repeater, the Big 9-4 in Troy, New York. AMSAT is looking for an electronics engineer with radio frequency experience to join its Fox Plus team. To tell us more about these exciting positions within AMSAT, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. The team will be a collaboration of up to 10 electrical, mechanical, software, and systems, and engineer volunteers. There will also be an opportunity to design and build the RF communications subsystems for a series of low Earth orbit 1U and 3U CubeSats to support AMSAT's educational engineering objectives. Mechanical engineers are also needed to join AMSAT's Fox and Golf CubeSat teams. They will be a collaboration of an all-volunteer team of up to 12 electrical, mechanical, software, and systems engineers. These positions will entail an opportunity to use structural design and analysis skills to develop a series of low Earth orbit and highly elliptical orbit of U1 and U3 CubeSats. AMSAT volunteers are typically uh, work about five hours a day per week, and they uh, in their projects uh, to attend weekly meetings online. An amateur radio license and CubeSat experience are helpful, but not necessary. U.S. citizenship or proof of permanent residency is required. Interested persons should send an email with their resume and curriculum to volunteer at amsat.org. I'd like to thank AMSAT Assistant Vice President of Engineering, Jonathan Brandenburg, K-F-Y-I-D-Y, for the above information. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Taking a closer look at a few of the requirements for the electronics engineering position, you should have a working knowledge of analog and digital communications protocols. For example, FM, PSK, FSK, to provide digitally synthesized audio for FM modulated VHF, UHF, SHF voice and telemetry channels. Development opportunities can begin with modification of previous Fox designs and or by starting with a blank sheet for an original design. For the mechanical engineering position, your contribution may include the development of the space frame and deployable solar panel subsystem, the analysis of the thermal characteristics of the CubeSat, and the design of the thermal management system, and preparation and oversight of the environmental testing procedure and or management of documentation of the CubeSat's adherence to the launch provider's and space vehicle owner's specification. Again, interested persons should send an email with their resume curriculum vitae to volunteer at amsat.org. Again, that's volunteer at amsat.org. John Gendron, NJ4Z, has been named the recipient of the 2022 Roanoke Division AWRL Service Award. To introduce us to NJ4Z and to give us details about this award, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. This award is the highest and most prestigious recognition of an ARR member operator within the division's four states who has shown consistent and extensive leadership. First licensed as a technician in 2016, Genron quickly advanced to the general and amateur extra class licenses. At the same time, he helped revitalize the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, ARIES, in his area, as well as the York County Amateur Radio Society in Rock Hill, South Carolina. 
Gendron is the 55th recipient of the Roanoke Division ARRL Service Award, which began in 1968 and is bestowed annually. Judges for the award are past recipients. The award is also nicknamed the Vic Clark Award after one of the original winners, Victor Clark, W4KFC. He's now a silent key, and he was a Roanoke Division director and ARRL president. The list of all 55 winners, as well as the history of the award, can be found on the Roanoke Division's website. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Gendron's story about reinvigorating York County Amateur Radio Society is featured in the club station column in the September 2022 issue of QST. He also has a YouTube channel called From the Ham Shack. He's an avid DX chaser and can often be found activating parks for parks on the air. Nominations for the 2023 Roanoke Division ARRL Service Award recipient will open in January 2024. The sun continued acting out this week when it spewed out a strong solar flare, causing radio blackouts over the United States and Latin America. The flare, classified as an M8.6 class flare, was released by the Sunspot Region 3234 at around 12.50 p.m. Eastern Time on February 28th, according to NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center. As the flare hit our planet, it interacted with the atmosphere, causing a loss of signal below 30 megahertz over much of the Americas for the 30 minutes after the flare arrived. This came only days after a spectacular aurora lit up the night sky across the world as a result of a coronal mass ejection from the sun. Solar flares are powerful jets of electromagnetic radiation, mostly X-rays, blown out from the sun's surface. They're usually emitted from sunspots when the twisted magnetic field lines around these regions suddenly realign, often also releasing a plume of solar plasma known as a coronal mass ejection, or CME. The weakest are the A-class flares, with an increasing intensity of flare being categorized as B-class, C-class, M-class, and finally, at their most powerful, an X-class. Each class is ten times more powerful than the last. X-class flares are ten times more powerful than the M-class, and an X-10 flare is ten times more powerful than an X-1 flare. The most recent M8.6 class flare is therefore nearly as powerful as an X-class flare. Solar flares cause radio blackouts due to them ionizing the Earth's ionosphere. High-frequency radio waves, such as those used in communications, must bounce off the ionosphere to reach their destination, meaning that if the flare ionizes that layer, the waves become degraded or are completely absorbed. The emissions of X-rays ionize the lower ionosphere as the D region at altitudes close to 80 to 90 kilometers, or 50 to 56 miles, which actually absorbs high-frequency radio waves, thereby stopping them from continuing up to the higher ionosphere, where they get bounced back towards the ground. This absorption effectively causes the radio blackout because the signals don't reach their intended targets. Civil aviation is the main industry affected by these radio blackouts. Usually, long-range communications with aircraft over large remote areas or oceans where there's no ground-based radio network. High frequency is a primary method for aircraft in these areas to communicate with air traffic, for example. Flights over North Atlantic will communicate with oceanic air traffic control centers provided by Canada, Iceland, and the UK. Mike Hapgood, a space weather scientist at the STFC Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK, said, Many aircraft also have a SATCOM as a backup, but high frequency is mandatory as part of the international agreed procedures. So HF blackouts can disrupt those links, but in general only for a few tens of minutes, so the industry can work around that disruption. These blackouts will not affect takeoff and landing, as aircraft will then use short-range VHF radio links. More powerful solar flares can cause more widespread effects, but thankfully much more are rare. The 1859 Carrington event is thought to have been a result of the largest and most powerful X-class flare, resulting in an incredible aurora, and even some fires in telegraph stations. An equivalent flare today might cause massive impacts to the electrical grid. The sun is expected to get more and more active, producing more sunspots and releasing more solar flares and CMEs in the coming years as it approaches the solar maximum of its current solar cycle, Solar Cycle 25. 24 complete solar cycles have been recorded since observations began in 1755, with Solar Cycle 25 predicted to peak in 2025. According to the trade publication Radio Inc., former Federal Emergency Management Agency head Craig Fugate 
who's always been a proponent of local radio, has signed a letter along with former FEMA officials asking the federal government to help making sure all automakers include AM radio in the electric vehicles. The Wall Street Journal was the first to report the letter Monday. In it, Fugate says, when all else fails, radio stations are often the last line of communications that communities have. Some automakers are dropping AM radio from their newer electric vehicles because they say the vehicles generate electromagnetic frequencies on the same wavelength as AM radio signals, creating buzzing and signal fading from the interference. According to the Wall Street Journal, the letter sent to members of Congress included signatures from seven former FEMA administrators. The letter was also sent to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. The letter states that AM radio serves as a linchpin of the infrastructure behind the Federal National Public Warning System, which provides emergency alert and warning information from FEMA to the public during national disasters and extreme weather events. They say spiking AM radio represents a grave threat to future disaster response efforts. The journal article says 47 million people in America still listen to AM radio, citing Nielsen statistics. You're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available worldwide as a podcast from our web at www.twiar.net. Amateur radio balloon hobbyists are worried that the small balloons they launch into the sky could be shot down or that the focus on balloons could lead to tight restrictions on their little-known hobby. Speculation has grown about whether one of the unidentified objects taken down by a United States Air Force F-22 on February 11th over Canada's Yukon Territory was a small party-style balloon launched by a hobby group whose name is a whimsical reference to the children's film Up. The Northern Illinois Bottle Cap Balloon Brigade recently said one of its balloons went missing in action on February 11th near an island off the coast of Alaska. People launch balloons for radio experiments or as a part of projects to learn more about technology, balloons, and the sky, as well as for fun, according to Dave Ackerman, a member of the United Kingdom High Altitude Society, who has launched nearly 100 larger latex balloons. Now enthusiasts are concerned there will be a knee-jerk reaction to what's happened, he said in an interview. He said he hoped that authorities and hobbyists could coordinate on reasonable guidelines or rules if needed. It's also in the interests of authorities not to be shooting down party balloons with missiles. A new activity being introduced this June by the Parks on the Air organizers is going to be different from the casual, portable outdoor operating experience activators and hunters enjoy. Here with all the details from Parks on the Air is Matt Heer, N3NWV. Howdy, Poda folks. I'm Matt, N3NWV, and today is an exciting day for Parks on the Air. We have just announced the 2023 POTA plaque event. The date is June 3rd and 4th, UTC. So 0000 June 3rd to 2359 June 4th. For those of you new to Parks on the Air, the plaque event has been an annual occasion since 2018. It represents a way for operators, both activators and hunters, to distinguish themselves amongst the already distinguished crowd of POTA operators. The event is open to all licensed amateurs who are members of the Parks on the Air program and who abide by the special event rules. Now, for the most part, the rules are just the regular POTA rules. There are, however, one or two caveats that you need to be aware of, some of which are new for 2023. The first change is that starting this year, we will not count QSOs made on the WARC bands for plaque eligibility. The work bands are still fine and dandy for day-to-day POTA use, including if you just want to do regular old POTA during the event. But note that because of the nature of the event, we have decided not to count QSOs made on 60, 30, 17, or 12 towards totals that will be considered for awarding plaques. What has not changed is that all valid modes still do count for POTA QSOs, and the standard POTA rules for determining what is a unique QSO haven't changed. 
The second change specific to the plaque event is the elimination of the Enfer multiplier for either QSO totals or park counts. You're still welcome to go and set up at an Enfer and log it for regular POTA, get credit for multiple QSOs and multiple parks. But for the purposes of the plaque totals, one QSO from one park at a time. If you are set up at an Enfer and you want to count all two, three, four, however many parks you're at, you're going to have to do it the old school way. You're going to have to go QRT at park number one and then fire up at park number two, even though you haven't moved, log them separately and redo the QSOs if you want to count them more than one time. Both of these changes are based in large part on community feedback. The goal is to make the event the best possible representation of our ham radio values and as equitable and inclusive as we possibly can make it. And under the category of inclusivity, we have included some new plaque categories in the awards section. Specifically, we've added rookie categories to both the activator and hunter sections. What's a rookie? Well, a rookie is somebody who's done the first one of either activating or hunting within the last 365 days prior to the event. So if you're relatively new to POTA, you now have a category where you can compete without having to go up against the big guns that have years of experience on you. All the new event details have been posted on all of the POTA properties. So you can check the docs on POTA.app, Facebook, Slack, Discord, whatever suits you to get all of the details and start your planning for the 2023 POTA plaque event. 7-3 and good luck. We'll see you there. The International Amateur Radio Union announced that Human Security for All will be this year's theme of World Amateur Radio Day on April 18th, 2023. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with all the details you need to know for the upcoming World Amateur Radio Day celebration. That day is being celebrated with a two-week operating event occurring April 11th through the 25th. Special event stations will be operating from around the world, making two-way radio contacts to call attention to the HS4A campaign. The concept of human security measures the security of individuals by things essential to one's well-being. This includes economics, food, health, and the environment personal factors, the community, and political factors as well. Amateur radio is uniquely positioned to address those challenges by promoting technical knowledge, practical skills, innovative technology, and the deployment of backup systems at the community level that can be called upon in times of emergency. Programs like the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, ARIES, empower hams to be more resilient in times of crisis. ARRL's Learning Center has several courses that can train users to help them gain those skills. IARU is a federation of the National Amateur Radio Societies over 150 countries worldwide. It's a global advocate for amateur radio through its sector membership in the International Telecommunications Union and an agency of the United Nations and other activities. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The International Amateur Radio Union, a federation of the National Amateur Radio Societies of over 150 countries worldwide, is the global advocate for amateur radio through its sector membership in the International Telecommunication Union, an agency of the United Nations, and other activities. The United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security and the World Academy of Art and Science are partnering with the International Amateur Radio Union in the campaign. In a release, the partners wrote, Amateur radio has repeatedly demonstrated its ability to address human security needs. It is a truly global communications medium comprising some 3 million radio enthusiasts connecting communities and the peoples of the world. ARRL participates in World Amateur Radio Day each year. It was on this day in 1925 that the International Amateur Radio Union was formed in Paris. ARRL co-founder Hiram Percy Maxim was its first president. For additional World Amateur Radio Day resources, visit the ARRL webpage and search for World Amateur Radio Day. Radio stations in several Russian cities were disrupted on February 22nd by the sound of air raid sirens and a warning of imminent missile strikes. The broadcasts were reportedly heard on Russian network radio across many cities. Recordings of the broadcast were shared on the social media network Telegram and reported on by Medusa. Medusa an independent news agency now based in Latvia, was forced to move its operations out of Russia during the media crackdown that followed Russia's February 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Emercom, the Russian Ministry for Civil Defense, Emergency Situations, and Elimination of Consequences of Natural Disasters, confirmed the broadcasts in a statement on its Telegram channel blaming an unspecified hacker attack on servers of a number of commercial radio stations in some regions of the country. 
Varanat's regional national authorities reportedly blamed collaborators of the Kiev regime for the hack. Stations reportedly compromised in the hack include Relax FM, Comedy Radio, Humor FM, and Avto Radio, all of which are owned by GPM Radio, the largest radio holding company in Russia. According to a Telegram post by Avto Radio, the hack was focusing on satellite signals used by the network to distribute its programming. There is a new FT8 app for Android during the rounds. It's called FT8CN from BG7YOZ in China. It's a free download and unrestricted in its use. It's in the early stages of development, but is already up to version 0.86. You'll need to give your device permission to allow the install of the app. There are various ways to configure the radio connection. The simplest Vox appears to be the Android device's internal mic and speaker. Of course, you could pipe audio directly in and out via the audio socket on your tablet or phone. DirectCat allows a USB connection, Bluetooth is available, and connection via a Wi-Fi network. All these seem to be in early stages of development. It also plots the action to a live map. You can download the APK file from github.com slash noboy slash FT8CN slash releases. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available. And now, here is our tech guy, Rich DeMuro. What is going on? I'm Rich DeMuro, and this is Rich on Tech, the show where I talk about the tech stuff I think you should know about. As you know, I'm broadcasting live from Los Angeles, typically known for its sun and fun. But the last couple of days, it has been all about rain. It has been snowing. There's been sleet. Something called, I think it's grapple. I don't know. Who calls it that? No one I know. We just called it sleet. It has been nonstop. It was so rainy over the past couple of days, you would not believe you're in Los Angeles. It is so rainy and wet in Los Angeles. The 405 at this point is just one big slip and slide. But in all seriousness, this rain is a very serious thing in in California, in Los Angeles, because we're just not used to it. So, of course, I'm a little introspective and thinking about weather apps so I posted to my Instagram today, at Rich on Tech, a bunch of useful weather apps. Now, here's the thing. Bill, uh, one of the folks behind this show, actually talked about this very idea for one of the first shows. He said, Rich, you should talk about how Dark Sky is no longer a thing, and Apple bought them, and you know some alternative weather apps. And I was like, Bill, do people really care? Let's be honest. There's, there are two types of people in this world, people that care about the weather forecast and people that do not care about the weather forecast. My wife is a weather forecast fanatic. She checks her apps every minute of the day. It drives everything she does from what she wears to work in the morning to what she plans for the afternoon to her drive. So let me give you a little background about Dark Sky. So this was an app and a a company that was very, very popular. And the reason they were popular is uh, they had this really spot on notification technology that if it was going to start raining, they would send you a notification saying, hey, we're predicting rain in your area in the next 17 minutes. And you'd be like, what? How do they know? How do they do this? I don't know how they do it. But it was so good. And it was pretty much the favored weather app for both Android users and some iOS users um, until Apple decided, you know what, this is pretty good technology. Let's purchase it. So they purchased this technology. I think it was like back in you know, a couple years ago. And then immediately they shut down the Android app. So all the Android users were like, no, nah, sorry, no more, no more dark sky for you. And then they took the technology and they mixed it into their own weather app. So if you have an iPhone, you've probably seen those little notifications that say, hey, uh, it's going to start raining your location in the next uh, you know, eight minutes. That's all because of dark sky. And then they're going ahead and they're going to shut down these other what's called an API. So other weather apps were able to tap into dark sky and use that information to make their apps better. That's called an API. Well, now 
Apple is going to shut that off as of, according to the website, March 31st, 2023. But I think they actually extended that. I think that was supposed to happen last year. But I think because of the pandemic and all that stuff, they said, OK, we'll throw you a bone. We'll let it stay for a little bit longer. So all these apps that rely on Dark Sky for this really cool technology are now suddenly like, OK, now what do we do? So I went through and I looked at some of the, my favorite apps and some of the useful apps out there. And I'll go through some of these apps. And some of them were suggested by users as well. Uh, but the first one is called Windy. This app is really great if you love full screen visualization. So if you just like seeing what it looks like around you outside from you know space, this is just a fantastic app for that because it lets you scroll through all different kinds of visual visualizations, whether it's precipitation, whether it's wind, whether it's lightning, and it's just a nice big map to see that and that big map animation, sort of like what you see on the news, right? So Windy is the app for you if you like that. Then there's an app called Overdrop, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a, a very minimalistic app. It's very beautiful. Some people are calling it the Dark Sky 2.0 because it's it's easy to understand. It looks really good. It functions very good. All of the basics are on one page. So they've got these nice, beautiful animations at the top. You could see exactly what you need to know, like the current conditions, the hourly forecast, and then you can scroll down and see the rest of what you need. Plus, they do precipitation notifications. And so if you like those notifications that you used to get, especially on Android, from Dark Sky, Overdrop can maybe fill that void. Now, Overdrop is still powered by Dark Sky, but I was reading on their website and they said, no, no, we've got some tricks up our sleeve. We're going to switch to some other providers once Dark Sky goes away. But right now, they're still able to use that one. Now, another app that's really bright and kind of fun, and this is a, a very good app. I, I recommended it to my mom, and she used it for many, many years, is called Hello Weather. And again, very much like Overdrop, but it's minimalistic. It's got nice, big kind of graphics. It's got big bar charts that just tell you what you need to know. So you get this nice, rich visual, visualization of the week ahead. So I can see today we've got 100% rain in the forecast. Tomorrow it's 55%. Monday it's back to 100%. Then Tuesday 95%. Wednesday 90%. Oh my gosh, what is happening here in California? Uh, and then Thursday it'll be sunny. But I can see that really easily on this app. So that one is very nice and simple to use. Now, this next app you're going to love or hate. It's called Carrot Weather. And I actually interviewed the founder of this app a couple of years ago. And it's so funny, nice guy, but you go on this app and it is super snarky and people love that about this app. So if you want your weather with personality, Carrot Weather is where you got to go. So you can choose from, you've got this slider and you can choose from whatever you want your weather to be like, okay? So you've got personality from uh, just fun, or uh, sorry, just regular. Then you've got friendly, then you've got snarky, but you can try it out. Carrot weather, and people like it because it's also very simple. Then you've got an app called Wonderground. And the thing about Wonderground, it's actually, I think it's like Weather Underground, but it's, it's from the same folks that do the Weather Channel, which is now owned by IBM, which is not the same as the Weather Channel on your TV, by the way. So they're, they're, they're different, uh, as far as I know. So the Weather Channel, or Weather Underground, Wonderground, uses data from 250,000 personal weather stations. So they boast these hyper-local weather forecasts. It also collects some information from your phone sensors, and I know that the Weather Channel uh, kind of got in trouble for that when people realized that they were using that information, so just be aware of that. Uh, but this one is really very simple. It's kind of basic, but it has all the information you need if you want to take that deep dive. Again, same company as the Weather Channel. And then finally, we've got this app called Climb, C-L-I-M-E. This has a great radar imagery, plus all the vitals. So if you just want to scroll through and see the wind, the visibility, the AQI, the humidity, and the moon phase all in one place, you got it on this app, plus the big radar screen. It also has notifications for precipitation, so if you like that, it has it. It also has notifications for major changes like lightning or other things that are happening with the weather. Now, those require payment. Like a lot of these apps are kind of the freemium model, which means the basics are free, but you're going to pay for the rest. And this one, out of all the apps, I mean, they all push kind of a paid product, but this one really pushes their paid product. I was getting a notification or a pop-up screen to switch to the paid stuff like very, very often on this one. So that's called Climb. 
My name is Rich Demiro. Thanks so much for listening. There are so many ways you can spend a rainy day and your time. I do appreciate you spending it right here with me. I'll talk to you real soon. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the Ancient Amateur Archives. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. On March 4, 1929, Herbert Hoover, the former Secretary of Commerce who had helped amateur radio during its embryonic years, became President of the United States. Less than eight months later, the nation was thrown into the Great Depression. Stock prices fell 80 percent, the gross national product fell 50 percent, and unemployment was at 25 percent. It did not sound like a good time to waste money on a frivolous hobby such as amateur radio. And yet, the early 1930s was the period of the greatest growth in our history. From 1929 census of 16,829, amateur radio expanded 276% in five years to a total of 46,390 in 1934. What was life like in our hobby of 75 years ago? QST was 25 cents per issue. One of the interesting columns in it was called Calls Heard, which was simply a list of page after page of call signs that were heard by various stations reporting in. Each month, hams would scan the hundreds of calls listed to see if their signals had been noticed. One of the call signs listed was W2XAF, which was not an amateur station, but rather the shortwave relay of WGY Schenectady. In fact, in the 1930s, there were so many broadcast stations with shortwave relays that the call book listed them in addition to amateur call signs. Most of the ads in QST at that time were for components to construct your own station. Tubes, resistors, and condensers, not capacitors, condensers, were displayed in full-page ads, RCA and DeForest were the dominant entities in the tube field. If you needed A, B, and C batteries, the Burgess Battery Company in Madison, Wisconsin would supply them. As the 1930s progressed, more companies appeared with kits or even assembled units. Hammerland, then known as Hammerland Roberts Incorporated, made its debut with the AC Pro, an eight-tube Superhet receiver. National's new receiver was the SW3. Radio Engineering Labs, known as REL of Long Island City, supplied low-cost transmitters and receiver kits. In 1931, one of these kits was at the center of a legal battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court. RCA, which held the DeForest patents on the regenerative circuit, sued REL. Edwin Armstrong, who actually invented regeneration but lost a controversial court battle with DeForest, saw this as an opportunity to win back his patent. He purchased 51% of REL stock and proceeded to fight the grand battle once more. Unfortunately, in 1934, the Supreme Court ruled that DeForest, not Armstrong, was the inventor of regeneration. Armstrong could take some small consolation in that another of his inventions was finally put to good use in amateur radio, super regeneration. Invented in the early 1920s, super regeneration provides very high sensitivity on AM signals. However, it has almost no selectivity, a very high noise level in the absence of stations, and radiated a broad interfering signal to nearby receivers. It was useless on medium wave or short wave, but was perfect for the 5 meter band at 56 megacycles. During the early 1930s, Ross Hull, QST's associate editor, wrote many articles about 5 meters and the surprising propagation there. Many phone stations appeared on the 56 megacycle band and almost all used super regeny receivers 
and some even operated full duplex. If UHF phone doesn't interest you, how about amateur television? In 1931, you ask? Unbelievably, the answer is yes. In 1931, an article appeared in QST describing the spinning disc mechanical television system that had been around since the 1920s. It was clumsy and crude, but it worked. The Jenkins Television Corporation of Passaic, New Jersey, offered a spinning disc kit within QST's pages. Within nine years, however, the mechanical system was rendered obsolete by RCA's all-electronic system. The Madrid Conference was held in 1932. Unlike the 1927 Washington Conference, amateur radio was not in danger and no frequencies were lost. 1932 also saw the expansion of the phone bands, but a special endorsement was needed to operate them. The old man was still around, with his letters in QST about rotten operators, rotten band conditions, rotten stations, etc. In fact, everything that didn't meet the old man's standards was rotten. For the past 15 years he had been writing, no one knew who he was. Finally, when Hiram Percy Maxim died in 1936, the ARRL revealed that Maxim indeed was the old man. By the way, since H.P. Maxim, W1AW, was still alive in the early 1930s, the ARRL station call was W1MK. Dealers included Uncle Dave Marks, whose first store was located at 115 North Pearl Street in Albany, New York. This address is significant to me because I now work in the building that stands on that site. By 1934, the Federal Radio Commission was superseded by the FCC and a new license structure with Class A, Class B, and Class C licenses was in place. In our next installment, we will take a look at the late 1930s, particularly some events in 1938. I hope you can join me. W8LT is the call sign for the Amateur Radio and RF Club at Ohio State University. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is here with a little history behind amateur radio at Ohio State University. The University Club has a long history at OSU, and archive records indicate that 1926 was the year it officially became a club, likely making it one of the oldest ones on campus. W8LT is just three years shy of celebrating its 100th anniversary. In the early 1920s, the call sign started out as 8LT until the Radio Act of 1927 added a W to all radio call signs. Then W8LT had been closely associated with WOSU Radio, the university's non-commercial station, which began as WEAO in June of 1922. The two stations were believed to have shared a small building near campus until the mid-1950s. In 1957, both stations were moved to small military-style Quonset huts. From January 1961 to January 1963, the club was unable to find a location anywhere on campus, so all of their equipment was put into storage in club member Bill Hale's K8JIX basement and brought only for ARRO field day each June. Eventually, W8LT found a new home in the Bell Tower at Ohio Stadium in a room directly below where the bell rings after every home game win. That location allowed a 500-foot long wire antenna to be stretched from the tower to a nearby smokestack at OSU's power station. The result was a powerful signal that could be heard clearly on stations around the world. When Ohio Stadium was renovated, W8LT moved again, this time to Beavis Hall, where it remains today, near the location of those old military-style Quonset huts. Today, the club continues to grow with 15 active members, including students, staff, and alumni. Faculty advisor Larry Fetch, K8HTC, said the club takes every opportunity to recruit new members and offer licensed testing sessions. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. More information is available on the W8LT website and on their Facebook page. W8LT is an AWRL-affiliated club and participates in the AWRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Program. We pause for stations along the network to identify. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, available as a stream to your favorite digital device on Spotify, TuneIn.com, Overcast, iHeartMedia, and wherever you download your podcasts.
CQ Worldwide Contest Director John Doerr, K1AR, is seeking nomination applications for the CQ Contest Hall of Fame, which recognizes individuals who have made significant contributions to amateur radio contesting, both in support of others and in personal operating achievements. In addition, candidates should be known for having made significant contributions to the hobby at large. Please include the following information with your application. Name of person being nominated. Call sign, if they're a licensed amateur. If they have multiple call signs, list the most recent. If your nominee is still living, please supply their current contact information as well as a description of their accomplishments and achievements and why you feel he or she should be elected to the CQ Contest Hall of Fame. Nominating club and contact information. This is only for the purpose of contacting you in case of questions and will not be published. The name of the nominating club. Your contact name, mailing address, phone number, and email address. Nominations will be accepted until March 19th, 2023. Send your responses to K1AR via email at cqk1ar at gmail.com. That address again, cqk1ar at gmail.com. The 2023 inductees will be announced during a ceremony at the Dayton Hamvention Contest Dinner on May 20th, 2023. The year-long ARRL Volunteers on the Air VOTA event continues on the VOTA site. You can also see the state activation schedule for weekly W1AW portable operations, including these March 8th through the 15th, Kentucky, W1AW slash 4, March 8th through the 15th in Idaho, W1AW slash 7, March 15th through the 21st, Virginia, W1AW slash 4, and March 15th through the 21st in Ohio, W1AW slash 8. And just a reminder, there is no W1AW portable activation on March 1st through the 7th in order not to interfere with the ARRLDX contest on March 4th through the 5th. And here are some upcoming contests for this month, March 2nd through the 3rd. It's the Walk for the Bacon QRP contest, that's CW. The CWAPS test on March uh, 2nd, that will be CW also. March 2nd, the NRAU 10-meter activity contest, CW phone and digital there. Also on March 2nd, the SKCC Sprint Europe, CW. March 3rd, the NCCC Riddy Sprint, that is, of course, digital. Also on March 3rd, the NCC Sprint again, that's digital. And on March 3rd, the K1USN Slow Speed Test, that is CW. On March 5th, the ARRL International DX Contest, that's single sideband phone. On March 4th through the 12th, the Novice Rig Roundup, that's CW. And also on March 4th, it's Wake Up QRP, that's Sprint, and it is also CW. And some upcoming section state and division conventions to be aware of on March 3rd through the 4th in uh, Birmingham Fest, hosting the ARRL Alabama Section Convention, that's in Trussville, Alabama. March 3rd through the 4th, the Greater Houston Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Texas State Convention. That's in Rosenberg, Texas. March 18th, the Mark St. Patrick's Day Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL West Texas Section. Midland, Texas is where that event's being held. And on March 18th, the Charleston Area Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL West Virginia Section Convention, Charleston, West Virginia. ARRL International DX Contest Log Upgrades are now available for Hamdash. N3FJP's ARRL International DX Contest Log 5.1.4 for U.S. and Canadian users and the DX version for users outside the U.S. and Canada, ARRL International DX Contest Log 3.7.4 are now available. These upgrades include support for Hamdash and the ability to sort the notes list by clicking on the column header. Upgrades are free for registered users. If you are running a version of the software released after January 2021, it will detect the new upgrade and offer to retrieve it for you. If you have any problems with the automatic upgrade, or if you are running an older version, you can install the latest version directly from the website at www dot n3fjp.com. Again, that's www.n3fjp.com. It is time for the weekly propagation forecast report brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that this was a busy week for geomagnetic storms. A solar wind stream from an equatorial hole and a coronal mass ejection blew geomagnetic numbers seemingly off the scale, with the planetary A index on Monday hitting 94. 
aurora was visible as far south as 40 degrees latitude. Imagine a line running from Reno, Nevada through Provo, Utah, then Denver, and then Kansas, Nebraska state line, Quincy, Illinois, Dayton, Ohio, and into Philadelphia. That whole area saw aurora. This week, the source of the 10.7-centimeter solar flux, the DRAO Observatory at Pennington, British Columbia, was again saturated by solar wind on February 25th, and the measurement was 279.3. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration corrected this to 152, which was thought to be a bit too low. The other recent saturation was on February 17th at 343.1, but for some reason NOAA let this one stand. This week we saw two new sunspot groups appear on February 23rd, another on the following day, another on February 27th, and then on February 29th one more, with two more coming on March 1st and one more on March 2nd. The average daily sunspot number rose from 107 to 126.3, but average daily solar flux declined from 162.4 to 158.2. The average daily planetary A and DICE rose from 10.6 to 27.7. So over the next few weeks, it appears that solar flux values should hit a peak around March 17th or 18th. Taking a look at the predicted solar flux now, it will be 165 on March 4th and 5th, 170 and 175 on March 6th and 7th, 180 on March 8th and 9th, 165 on March 10th and 11th, and 170 on March 13th through the 15th. The predicted planetary A and DICE is 18, 16, and 8 on March 6th through the 8th, 5 on March 19th through 14, and then 15, 8, 8, 5, 8, and 15 on March 15th through the 20th, respectively. Bruce Page, KK5D0, has checked in with this week's AMSAT report. And over the years, astronauts and cosmonauts have been active at various times, making random contacts. Back in the shuttle days, it was a more common occurrence. Today, it's much rarer. However, they still do make some contact. So what can you do to improve the odds that you might hear them and be able to actually make a contact with them? Well, first, you need to know what region of the world you're in and select the frequency that they use in that region. The voice downlink worldwide is 145.80 MHz FM. The uplink for the Americas is 144.49 MHz FM. However, the astronauts have been known to pick up the mic while the repeater was operational, in which case you will need to listen on 437.80 MHz FM. An uplink to the repeater on 145.99 MHz FM with a 67 Hz tone. Now that you have those frequencies, when should you listen? Well, the crew is awake from 0730 to 1930 Universal Coordinated Time. They have free time before work, which is about an hour and a half after they wake up and two hours before they go to bed. Astronauts that enjoy ham radio have been more prolific than those that have other interests. Your best shot is from 0730 to 0900 Universal Coordinated Time and 1730 to 1930 Universal Coordinated Time. Good luck, and hope you have a chance to make that contact, and do not forget to have your tape recorder running to have a lifelong memory of the contact. Thanks to Charlie AJ9N, Eris Metter, for the specifics on this report. Also thanks to Bruce Page. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station has announced that several schools are planning to communicate with the orbiting astronauts in the coming weeks. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has more. Lanahi High and Elementary School in Lanahi City, Hawaii, will attempt to contact between March 20th and 24th. Students attending the high school already study amateur radio, and the research is being done on the ISS, among other scientific pursuits. Stowe Magnet Middle School in Melbourne, Florida, will make their contact between March 27th and April 1st. In their application, Stone Magnet wrote that they work to inspire students to develop interest in science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, and those are, of course, STEM careers. ARIS is a cooperative venture of the International Amateur Radio Societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the U.S., participating organizations include NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program, SCAN, the ISS National Lab, Space Station Explorers, ARRL, the National Association of Amateur Radio, and AMSAT. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. ARISS is presently seeking contact proposals for the next round of school selections. You can visit the ARISS website for all the details. You're listening to America's premier amateur radio news magazine of the air. This week in amateur radio. From 
foundations of amateur radio. The world is filled with antennas. You'll find them on towers, buildings, cars, and on your next door neighbor's roof. They come in an astonishing variety, to the point where you might start thinking that antennas are a fashion accessory that vary with the season, and if you start digging through the history books, you'll come across designs that dial that variety up to 11. Possibly the most visible antenna today is the television antenna, and when you start noticing them, the more variation you'll discover. Their basic shape consists of a vertical pole, the mast, with a horizontal pole, the boom. Attached to the boom are various different shapes or elements that often vary in length according to some pattern. The shape is designed to collect as much electromagnetic radiation from a particular direction, or in the case of a transmitter, focus as much energy as possible into one direction. This focus is called gain. The more focus, the more gain. One of the oldest designs for this kind of antenna still in use today is the Yagi Uda or Yagi antenna. It was invented in 1923 by Shintaro Uda at the Tohoku Imperial University in Japan and popularized to the English-speaking world by his boss, Hidetsuku Yagi, who claimed to be the sole inventor in his Japanese patent application. He went on to file similar patents in Germany and the United States. Gain for Yagi varies depending on design. Generally, more elements means more gain. Sometimes you'll see a Yagi with weird shorter elements along the boom. This is a design to make the antenna work across multiple frequencies. Another way that this can be achieved is by adding traps along an element. They look like a thick stubby tube at some distance along an element. You can have more than one of these to allow for more frequencies. These improvements allow for several Yagi antennas to share elements and boom space, essentially combining several independent antennas into one. It can be tricky to discover in which direction a Yagi is pointing, but essentially the boom indicates the direction, and the end with the shortest element is the front. There's another type of antenna that to the casual observer looks similar. It's called a log periodic dipole array, LPDA or log periodic antenna. It was invented in 1952 by John Dunlavey, whilst he was contracted to the United States Air Force. He wasn't credited because it was classified as secret, later changed to restricted. In 1958, Dwight Isbell built a log periodic antenna as an undergraduate student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He was part of a larger team that included Raymond Duhamel, John Dyson and Robert Carell. Later, Paul Myers developed a variant that improved performance. Before I dig in, I'll also note that this antenna caused all manner of legal issues that are still in force today. The so-called Blonder Tongue Doctrine states that a patent holder isn't permitted to re-litigate the validity of a patent that has been held invalid previously. It was a result of the university attempting and ultimately failing to protect its patent for the widely copied antenna design. Reading about this is a fascinating discovery in how a single judge can make a massive impact on law and society. The log periodic antenna is designed in a way that to the uninitiated looks very similar to a Yagi antenna. It's based on the idea that you can design an antenna made up from independent dipoles that are spaced in such a way that they form an antenna where each dipole radiates to take advantage of its neighbours. Generally, a log periodic antenna looks like a triangle. Often the elements are on two separate booms, alternating side to side, or you'll see a zigzag structure that causes the antenna signal to alternate side to side. One characteristic of an antenna is called bandwidth. It's a measure of how many frequencies it can operate on within the constraints of the antenna. The wider the bandwidth, the more frequencies you can use with the same antenna. A Yagi antenna typically operates within about 4% of the design frequency. If you combine multiple Yagis by adding traps or different length elements, you'll end up with several frequencies, each with a similar range. A log periodic antenna, on the other hand, is designed to be used across a large range of frequencies. In shortwave broadcasting, there are log periodic antennas that operate between 6 and 26 MHz. In more common use today, you'll find log periodic antennas used for higher frequencies. It's not unusual to find log periodic antennas that operate between 400 and 4000 MHz. For even more confusion, you can share the boom of a log periodic antenna with a Yagi antenna, 
as is popular in fringe television reception areas. Some other things to note are that for a Yagi, most of the elements are passive, and only one is generally a driven element. In a log periodic antenna, all elements are driven. For a Yagi antenna, more elements means more gain, whereas for a log periodic antenna, it means more frequencies. I'll also point out that there are experiments where the frequency range for Yagi antennas is being increased to more than 20% of the main frequency by varying the design. Much of this is achieved by using computer simulations to test many different virtual antennas until one promising design pops out. This optimization technique can also be applied to log periodic antennas, resulting in very interesting shapes that look nothing like the antennas you see on the roof today. I've completely skipped over how these antennas are actually fed, as in how is the coax connected to the antenna. That's a whole different topic of conversation worthy of many hours of research and discussion. Next time you look at a spiky antenna, you should be able to discover if it's a Yagi or log periodic, or both, and why. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Kevin Beale, K8EAL, has joined ARRL staff as the Director of Development. John Ross, KD8IDJ, has more on the story in this report from League Headquarters. Kevin Beal, K8EAL, has a significant background in nonprofit administration. He joins ARRL after a career at his alma mater, Norwich University. He earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree there in international conflict management and resolution. As a cadet at Norwich University, he participated in the Naval and Marine Reserve Officers Training Corps, that's known as NROTC, and as part of the cadre, training new cadets, and he was a member of the Cavalry Troop. Beal and his wife live near ARRL headquarters with their two daughters and their recent rescued hound. On most weekends during the winter, he can be found on the road taking his oldest daughter to her next hockey game. Welcome, Kevin, to the ARRL, and you can read more about Kevin's story at ARRL. Org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Beal had a significant background in nonprofit administration and for the last 17 years has managed large scale projects and teams. His previous experience includes various roles supporting organizations and higher education situations with program management, events, alumni engagement, and fundraising. He's also worked on cybersecurity infrastructure training projects supported by the Federal Emergency Management Association and feels that amateur radio has a significant value as an emergency communications tool. With a father who was an electronics engineer during Vietnam in the U.S. Army Signal Corps, Beale has been surrounded by radio his entire life. I grew up in a household of spare electronics and communications equipment, where at home repair and soldering were commonplace, he said. He's excited to grow as a licensed ham, and was thrilled to make a contact from the Hiram Percy Maxim Memorial Station as W1AW. Bill looks forward to getting to know all the ARRL donors. There will be a little bit of competition and a whole lot of research going on later this year for participants in a CUSO party organized by Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, or HAMSI. Volunteer radio operators and shortwave listeners will join researchers at a number of U.S. universities sending, receiving, and recording signals during the October 14th solar eclipse. The data will be collected and used for testing computer models of the ionosphere to assess its variability. This is the first of two eclipses over North America that HAMSI will be studying. The second one is on April 8, 2024. Both solar eclipse QSO parties encourage the use of CW, single sideband, and digital modes on 160 through 6 meters. At the same time, hams who operate CW and digital beacons, Whisper and FST4W, will be able to take part in the Gladstone Signal Spotting Challenge. Registration starts in July. Organizers stress the importance of this opportunity. As they say on the project's website, if we miss the chance to collect meaningful data in 2023 and 2024, it will be decades before North American hams and researchers get another opportunity. If you'd like to get involved, visit hamsci.org. Looking for older editions of our news service? You can find them all as part of the Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications through the facilities of the Internet Archive. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio.
Calling it the biggest advance in 11-meter citizens band radio since the spectrum was expanded from 23 to 40 channels in 1977, Cobra Electronics has launched a line of 11-meter radios that can use FM as well as AM, now making 11-meter citizens band all mode. The company says the ability to use FM in the 11-meter radio spectrum 29.965 to 27.405 MHz assigned by the Federal Communications Commission is a boon to truckers, off-road vehicle operators, and anyone else who uses the license-free two-way radio technology. It says the FM transmission CB radio mode provides users with the ability to enjoy high-quality, clear audio during radio conversations with nearby or strong CB radio transceivers. Meanwhile, in those instances where distance is a priority and or the signal from the other party is weak, AM can be used in either full AM or single sideband modes, consisting of upper sideband and lower sideband. Of course, the audio quality won't be as good, but that's the trade-off for distance. Cobra said its ability to offer FM in its CB radios is the fruit of four years of petitioning the FCC for permission to do so. To boost its case, the company sought input from the CB radio customers, sources from online CB radio forums, off-road vehicle clubs, and CB radio distributors. The strategy worked. The FCC granted permission for AM FM CB radios to be sold in the United States in 2021. Our team has been on the forefront of working with the FCC since 2016 to make AM FM CB possible, said Gail Babbitt, CEO of Cedar Electronics, parent company of Cobra, in a news release. The implications this will have on users like professional truck drivers, fleet managers, and local delivery services will be amazing, making communications clearer and more productive than ever while on the road. The United States military is getting ready to do some intense testing on the ionosphere. Two ionospheric sensors will be tested on board the International Space Station this spring in an experiment designed to ultimately improve HF radio communications for the U.S. Department of Defense. The website, Breaking Defense, reported that the sensors are to be sent to the space station this month. The U.S. military has been revisiting the importance of HF radio as an alternative to satellites, having realized that U.S. satellites could become compromised or destroyed by enemy attack. HF bands are already being used by the three branches of the U.S. military for some long-range communications. Andrew Nicholas, one of the lead researchers on the sensor project, told the Breaking Defense website that the sensors will be measuring ionospheric particle density and its impact on the radio waves passing through it. He said that the data from the tests will help in the development of better ionospheric monitoring models. Eventually, the military might even consider creating satellites that would constantly monitor such important ionospheric changes to assist in the performance of HF communication. A popular contester and DXer, who had once been the chief engineer for the Federal Communications Commission, has just become a silent key. Raymond Spence, W4QAW, was so devoted to contesting and DXing that a 1984 newspaper interview with him described the traffic-stopping view his collection of towers provided to motorists who would see them from a nearby highway. The Washington Post article noted that much of the six and a half acres of Raymond's property in Virginia served him well. Raymond, who was retired from the Post as chief engineer for the FCC in nearby Washington, D.C., became a silent key on February 18th due to heart failure. Born in 1929, he was an active ham for much of his life. His basement radio room served as his main contest station, and he was a top performer in many major contests. He is listed on the DXCC honor roll and was a member of the National Capital DX Association and the Potomac Valley Radio Club. A group of Australian amateurs, including Dan Sutton, VK6NAD, Michael Tut, VK6TU, and others, will activate the special event call sign VI6CRO in recognition of the NASA Carnarvon and Overseas Telecommunications Commission Carnarvon historic location. The activation will occur April 17th and ending April 23rd to coincide with the massive surge of visitors as a result of the April 20th eclipse event in the area. The station will be set up in the middle of the historic OTC building between the cast grain horn used during Apollo 11 and the large 30-meter dish antenna. 
The station will have FM satellite capability and intends to organize contacts with Australian and Indonesian amateurs, hopefully via the ISS repeater and AO91 if they are operating at the time. Also near this station is the Carnarvon Space and Technology Museum. Buzz Aldrin opened the museum in June 2012, so the NASA connection will resonate through the event, at which many hundreds of visitors are expected to attend daily. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is proud to announce a panel discussion on March 25, 2023, at 12 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, titled The Future of Amateur Radio Balloons, in the current era. The discussion will be moderated by Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, and will explore the current state of amateur radio balloons in light of recent events, including the United States Air Force's decision to shoot down unidentified objects in American airspace. The panel will feature some of the most prominent figures in the field of amateur radio ballooning, including experts in the technology and enthusiasts who have used it to pursue their interests. The discussion will cover a wide range of topics, including the history of amateur radio balloons, the challenges faced by balloonists today, and the future of the technology in an era where the skies are becoming increasingly crowded. According to Eric Guth, 4G1UG, the moderator of the discussion, the future of amateur radio balloons is a topic of great importance to the amateur radio community, especially in light of recent events. We need to discuss how we can continue to pursue our interests in the face of new challenges and restrictions and explore new avenues for innovation and growth in the field. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is a leading online event for the amateur radio community, bringing together enthusiasts, experts, and manufacturers from around the world. The expo features a wide range of presentations, exhibits, and interactive sessions covering topics from radio technology to emergency communications and everything in between. This year's event promises to be the most exciting yet, with a lineup of speakers and panelists that is sure to inform and inspire. Registration for the Expo is open now, and attendees can sign up for the panel discussion on the future of amateur radio balloons in the current era as part of their ticket. For more information on the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo and to register for the event, please visit www.qsotodayhamexpo.com. When emergency radio equipment from Barrett Communications arrived from Australia on February 14th, the director of the Rainbow Radio League, Yulu Radio Movement, noted that the date was Valentine's Day and declared the delivery a gift of love. Donald DeRiggs, J88CD, said he was grateful for the donation, the third of its kind provided by Barrett for emergency use in St. Vincent and the Grenadine Islands. The equipment is not only a useful way to bolster communications during hurricane season, but a way to safeguard areas such as those who are left vulnerable during the eruption of the volcano La Soufrière in 2021. The Australian company has taken an active role in helping the island communities. Previous donations by Barrett were used to assist the island of Dominica in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria in 2017. Donald said as soon as this new equipment was programmed and deployed, there will be drills in May or early June to prepare for the coming hurricane season. The latest shipment was transported to Kingstown from the air cargo facility by Leslie Edwards, J88LE. This included HF radios, portable solar panels, spare microphones, a portable antenna mast, and broadband dipoles. Hours after a 6.4 magnitude earthquake rocked the already stricken region of Turkey and Syria on Monday, February 20th, Mainstream media turned its attention to the critical role that amateur radio is playing there. With communications taken down in much of the region of Turkey and northern Syria, amateur radio repeaters on VHF and UHF frequencies kept communications open for rescue work and other aid. That dramatic story was told on the BBC program Digital Planet on Tuesday, February 21st by Aziz Sasa, TA1E, president of the Turkish Amateur Radio Association. The retired engineer was interviewed by show host Gareth Mitchell, an amateur radio operator himself, with the call sign M7GJM. Aziz said that following the disaster, VHF and UHF repeaters throughout the region were the only means of communication for seven days, as rescuers and agencies shared frequencies and information. 
He said that the longer distant capabilities of HF were not as essential because most of the issues being handled were local and could be handled via shorter range frequencies. Asked what the greatest contribution of the HAMS has been so far, Aziz said we helped in saving lives. I believe that's quite a nice thing for us. You are listening to North America's premier news and information service for the amateur radio hobbyist. We are This Week in Amateur Radio. The origins of the Belgaum Hamble net predate the internet by several decades, when a group of young shortwave enthusiasts in the city of Belgaum in India would get together to study for their ASOC examinations in the physics lab of a local college where PAL, VU2PAL, was a professor. By 1973, the group, now licensed HAMS, had grown. In 1973, they formed the Hamble Amateur Radio Club. By 1988, the HAMS had agreed to have regularly scheduled QSOs with one another on 7.052.5 MHz, and little by little, the on-air circle of friends grew to include those living outside the immediate area. The net was formally launched by Professor Pal in November 1989. He moved it to 7.050 MHz and gave it a name, the Belgaum Hamble Net. He was also its first and most active net controller. According to the club's website, by the time he became a silent key in 2016, he had logged tens of thousands of QSOs via the net alone. The group's well-established 40-meter net tradition continues today from 7 a.m. to 8.45 a.m. Indian Standard Time, but the world has recently begun listening in. The net now uses YouTube to live stream its check-ins with net controllers BBEU, VU2, PNU, Umprakash, VU2, KOC, Joshi, VU2, BRJ, and Yusin, VU3, PMY. You can watch and listen, too. Check it out on YouTube. For anyone new to the world of ham radio, one of the things that takes a little getting used to is visiting the websites of authoritative experts in various fields and feeling like you've traveled back to the internet of 1999. As a hobby that lends itself to extremely utilitarian amateurs, the software site can feel a little left behind like that. Andy, KB1OIQ, on the other hand, is also a Linux enthusiast and has been putting together a complete Linux distribution with everything needed to operate a radio in the modern era. While most ham radio software seems to be developed for Windows, there is a lot available for Linux. It just takes a bit of tinkering and experimentation to get everything configured just right. Andy's Ham Radio Linux, or AHRL, takes a lot of the guesswork out of this. The distribution includes everything from contact logging software to antenna modeling, propagation forecasting, and electronic design. While tools like this are largely optional for operating radios themselves, there are also tools included to allow the user to operate various digital modes as well, which require some sort of computer interface to use. The other design consideration Andy made was something that most hams consider when choosing software which is that it should be able to run on extremely modest hardware. To that end, the distribution is based around Xubuntu and can run on 10-year-old machines with as little as 2 gigabytes of RAM. And for those interested more in software-defined radio specifically, there is another Debian-based Linux distribution called Dragon OS that we've featured a few other times as well, which is also worth checking out. The phone portion of the AWRL International DX Contest runs March 4th and 5th, 2023. The event is dedicated to DX contacts only. United States and Canadian stations may only contact DX stations and vice versa. The goal of the event is for operators to expand their knowledge of DX propagation on the HF and MF bands and to improve their operating skills and station capabilities. Participants may only use the 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter bands. This contest is an opportunity for stations to earn points in the year-long Volunteers on the Air operating event. Each ARRL member is worth one point and volunteers are worth even more. 
refer to the Volunteers on the Air webpage for more information. Logs submitted to ARRL's Logbook of the World are automatically tallied for points. According to a Scouting Magazine study of merit badges earned in 2022, radio has had the biggest jump. Special Events Station in K4S in Jasper, Tennessee. 2018 photo, Radio Scouting. It's now the 81st most popular merit badge, up from being 98th in 2021. Trailing just behind it is the biggest gains listed as the Electronics Merit Badge, which jumped 15 spots from 80th to 65th. To earn the rank of Eagle Scout, members must earn 21 badges, 14 of which are standard. The Scout gets to choose the remaining badges based on personal interests. Many Scouts take part in the Jamboree on the Air, which is being held October 20th through the 23rd of 2023. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. The only thing that worries me more than climbing to 400 feet on a July night with thunderstorms visible in the distance is climbing to 200 feet and then making a turn to the right and moving away from the tower six feet on a sidearm. Just the thought of making a sharp turn on a highway with no exits just doesn't seem natural but for a climber, it's a necessary part of the job. For the safety-oriented climber, we work to minimize the risk of death. Let's be honest here. If something goes very wrong on a sidearm, one of three things will happen. Death, poopy diapers, or serious injury. Let's examine some potential truths about sidearms. For openers, if the sidearm was about to fall off the tower, it would be visibly obvious just by looking at its mounting hardware most of the time. Also, if that structure survived the past year's worth of ice storms, 90 mile an hour winds, or worse without breaking, chances are it'll support my fat butt for a short amount of time just fine too. Since tower climbers usually own lots of straps, belts, and ropes, we have the ability to choose how we want to protect ourselves when working on sidearms. Basically, we can choose to secure ourselves to the tower or if we want to secure ourselves to the sidearm at all. Depending upon the width of the tower, the design of the sidearm will vary. On a 1-2 to two foot sidearm, many times I stay below it and stay strapped to the tower. I use two or three devices and lean out away from the tower so I'm just below the antenna I'm working on. If the antenna is too heavy to handle this way, I can secure it from above or work on it from above. If the sidearm is a big 6 foot mother, I prefer to climb out onto it to get my work done. What I do is use a very light but very strong rescue strap. It's about 10 feet long and strong enough to pull a car out of a ditch, yet light enough to carry in a big pocket. I attach it with two beaners about 5 feet above the sidearm on that side of the tower. The other end of the strap goes to my belt. I slide out onto the sidearm and often never strap onto it. Depending upon the width of the sidearm and the weight of the antenna I'm working on, I may never strap onto the sidearm at all. This way, if the sidearm breaks off the tower, I'll drop to the end of the strap and stop while the sidearm can fall away. If I was strapped to the sidearm too, my strap would have to catch all of that weight, which sounds like a bad idea to me. Again, each installation is different. One needs to know the age of the structure and look how well maintained it is and decide how to deal with safety based on a first-hand inspection of the sidearm. There is not much in nature that would put an equivalent weight load at the end of a sidearm equal to my 160 pound body weight. So a climber needs to be very aware of the risks and safety specs of his gear, not to mention the condition of the tower. The professional climber recognizes the danger and works to minimize the risk without losing lots of time and with minimal added weight. If you want to imagine a job I don't ever want is the guy that slides down the guy wires with the bucket of grease smearing a coating from end to end. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. You are listening to This Week in Amateur Radio, available as an on-demand stream from Spotify, Deezer, and wherever podcasts are available.
The Amateur Radio and the International Space Station program is seeking formal and informal education institutions and organizations, individually or working together, to host an amateur radio contact with a crew member on board the ISS. With more information you need to know, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from League Headquarters. Eris anticipates the contact will be held between January 1st, 2024 and June 30th, 2024. Crew scheduling and ISS orbits will determine the exact contact dates. To maximize these radio contact opportunities, Eris is looking for organizations that will draw large numbers of participants and integrate the radio contact into a well-developed educational plan. The deadline to submit a proposal is March 31st, 2023, and you can find all of the information at eris.org. An ERIS introductory webinar will be held March 1st, 2023 at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Eventbrite link to sign up for that free webinar is at eventbrite.com. ERIS, by the way, is a cooperative venture of the International Amateur Radio Societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. The United States sponsors are ARRL, the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, AMSAT, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, ARDC, NASA's Space Communication and Navigation Program, that's known as SCAN, and the International Space Station National Lab Space Station Explorers, known as SSE. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Crew members aboard the International Space Station will participate in scheduled amateur radio contacts. These radio contacts are approximately 10 minutes in length and allow students to interact with the astronauts through a question and answer session. An ARIS, A-R-I-S-S, contact is a voice-only communication opportunity via amateur radio between astronauts aboard the space station and classrooms. ARIS contacts afford education audiences the opportunity to learn firsthand from astronauts what it is like to live and work in space and to learn about space research conducted on the ISS. Students also will have an opportunity to learn about satellite communication, wireless technology, and radio science. Because of the nature of human spaceflight and the complexity of scheduling activities aboard the ISS, organizations must demonstrate flexibility to accommodate changes in dates and times of the radio contact. Amateur radio organizations around the world with the support of NASA and space agencies in Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe present educational organizations with this opportunity. The ham radio organization's volunteer efforts provide the equipment and operational support to enable communication between crew on the ISS and students using amateur radio. The primary goal of ARIS is to promote exploration of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics topics. ARIS does this by organizing scheduled contacts via amateur radio between crew members aboard the ISS and students. Before and during these radio contacts, students and educators, parents, and communities take part in hands-on learning activities tied to space, space technologies, and amateur radio. For more information, see www.ariss.org. And finally, to wrap up our news this week, imagine you had a rich uncle who wanted to fund some of your projects. Like, seriously rich. Thanks to shrewd investments, he's sitting on a pile of cash and is now legally obligated to give away $5 million a year to deserving recipients. That would be pretty cool indeed. But like anything else, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? Well, maybe not. According to the website Hackaday, it turns out that we in the amateur radio community, and even amateur radio adjacent fields, have a rich uncle named Amateur Radio Digital Communications, or ARDC. A foundation with a large endowment and a broad mission to support amateur radio, fund scholarships and worthy educational programs, and financially support technically innovative amateur radio and digital communications projects. As the foundation's outreach manager, John Hayes, K7EV, explained at Supercon 2022, ARDC is a California-based 501c3 nonprofit organization that has been in the business of giving away money to worthy projects in the amateur radio space since 2021. The group's roots go back much further than that, though, into the 1980s and explain its ample endowment. In a brilliantly visionary move, a ham named Hank Magnuski, KA6M, saw the potential for the new hotness of the Internet Protocol and asked John Postel, the then Internet Assigned Numbers Authority Administrator and pretty much the guy you went to if you needed an IP address in those wild and woolly early days of the Internet. John came through big time, with a Class A block of over 16 million IP addresses. Talk about getting in on the ground floor. Fast forward a few decades, and after giving away some of those Class A addresses to deserving amateur radio projects, ARDC decided it was time to cash in on some of their largesse. 
And so in 2019, they sold 4 million addresses to someone with deep pockets, and they made a ton of money in the process and set up a foundation. The foundation is now legally required to give away at least 5% of its money a year to qualified applicants, and John's talk ably covers exactly what that entails. Basically, anything that supports and grows amateur radio is at least in the right ballpark. Examples of past recipients include the University of Southern Florida's Amateur Radio Club, WB4USF, getting a $15,000 grant to buy equipment for their club station, $38,000 was granted to build an emergency communications mesh network in Rhode Island, and $236,000 went to the Kyushu Institute of Technology to build an open-source CubeSat network. Groups have used grant funds to make repairs and upgrades to storm-damaged repeater networks, build emergency communications trailers, and even $1.6 million to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to save their famed rooftop radome. Given their mission, a lot of grants go to educational outreach and scholarships. The scholarships include not just the usual post-secondary grants, but also a lot of STEM outreach. One of the first grants went to ARIS, or Amateur Radio on the International Space Station. That 2019 grant gave ARIS the funds necessary to design and build a custom amateur radio station for the ISS, with the aim of getting school kids interested in STEM by letting them talk directly to the hams aboard the ISS from a simple handy-talkie transceiver. The ARDC-funded station flew to the ISS on the SpaceX CRS-20 resupply mission in March 2020. The station's been used hundreds of times since and can be considered a smashing success in terms of outreach and engagement. John's talk was polished and professional. He'd already given it more than 40 times in 2022 by the time Supercon rolled around, and it really gets the wheels turning. If you're in a ham radio group or even in an area that's plausibly related, it probably makes sense to think about what your rich uncle can make possible. You can find John's talk on YouTube. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard in this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the AWRL Audio News Service, and the AWRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the Shortwave Listening Post, the Federal Communications Commission, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, The Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Rich on Tech Podcast, courtesy of Premier Networks, The International Telecommunications Union, The 425DX News, Parks on the Air and The Soda Reflector, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.